welcome to our second session in uh, blogging with manuscripts. We are very pleased to be joined tonight by the the initiative for blogging with manuscripts, namely teaching the codex, something that was um, started um, five years ago by a group um, of scholars and I immediately hand over to Mary Boyle, one of the founding members, to introduce the initiative. Can you hear me, everyone? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so hello and thank you very much to Henrika for putting together this series of events on blogging with manuscripts. Uh, just a reminder that the relevant hashtags for the session are at the bottom of the slides. Um, so I'm going to speak for about five minutes on the Teaching the Codex project as a whole, um, but I need to stress that I'm only one of the people behind it. Uh, my co-founder is Tristan Franklinos, a self-described classicist with medieval tendencies. Um, in 2017, Alex Peplow and Jessica Rahajo joined the team. They're both working on doctorates in history. Um, Alex works on the Holy Roman Empire and Jessica works on early Islamic funerary material culture. Um, I work on comparative German and English medieval literature. But nothing about teaching the Codex would have been possible without immense practical support from Julia Woolworth. Um, now, the project essentially came about through conversations between myself and Tristan. Could we just go back a slide? Sorry. Um, we'd started learning paleography as master's students at the same time in different faculties, um, classics and English, uh, and we had friends taking related courses across the humanities. Um, we recognised a whole range of different approaches within a single institution, all with their own merits, and our initial idea to get about 30 people in a room to share their ideas uh, tended to an international colloquium in 2016 with over 100 attendees. Uh, we had various conversations with the participants afterwards about where to go from there um, and that's how the blog and teachable features came to be and then these were followed by two further colloquia. Thanks to Jessica we've also been able to share quite a few of the papers from those colloquia as podcasts. We do have some plans for more in-person teaching the codex activities but those are on the back burner until you know we're all allowed to leave our houses again. Um, so that's a very brief outline and I'll use the rest of my time to talk about our digital offerings. Um, so could we have the next slide please? Um, to date most energy has gone into the blog and this is specifically intended to document approaches to learning and teaching paleography, uh, including very practical entries and reflections on teaching yourself. Um, we've had a huge range of really exciting posts, including our current manuscripts under lockdown series, um, as well as Leonor, who's uh, talking today. We had a post from Sarah Charles on making her own parchment uh, and Alison Ray, who's speaking at tomorrow's blogging with manuscripts on how we can use digital tools to reunite medieval libraries. Um, we've had entries on public outreach and paleography in schools as well as proposals for whole university course structures and digital skills training even before the pandemic. Um, the next slide, please. Um, our most popular blog post was from Glasgow's Johanna Green on a practical session she led for the Society of Northumbrian Scribes, a group of calligraphers based in northeast England, uh, bringing paleographic research and modern day calligraphy together for the public. Um, now, we're always pleased to receive uh, proposals for blog posts, so do get in touch if you have an idea. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the real focus today is our more overlooked offering, Teachable Features, which I think has the potential to be a really valuable tool. Um, when we first envisioned it, we imagined its users being quite varied. People looking for visual explanations of features they'd come across during classes, teachers of paleography and code ecology looking to illustrate relevant features in the classroom, people without access to special collections, which is now almost all of us. Um, we'd also hope the general public might be interested in clear and illustrated descriptions of manuscript features, um, a kind of behind the scenes look into manuscript studies. So far, our teachable features have been on the longer side, but we'd be delighted to receive short entries, even just an image and a clear description of what's going on, for example. Um, so far, um, we've had descriptions of a binding error by me, uh, Pricking and Ruling by Sean Witherden, How to uh, Read a Manuscript Description in a Catalogue uh, by Matthew Holford, which is our most popular entry uh, with over 2,200 views, um, a video on making goose feather quills from Henrika herself, and an explanation of trimming by Hope Doherty. I want to emphasise that um, 
as all manuscripts are unique, duplicate features are not only fine, but welcome. Um, there are more detailed guidelines on our website, which I've um, checked and revised today. Um, the last thing I want to say is that if you get in touch via email, uh, via the website or via Twitter, you're likely to find me on the other end. But we're all very friendly and we'd all be delighted to hear from you. Um, and I'll now hand over to Leonor to tell us all about her recent post. Leonor, can you unmute yourself, please? Sorry, I was speaking with myself. <laughs> Sorry. Good evening. Before talking about my post, I want to thank Henrike Leinemann for letting me participate in these interesting sessions, to Mary Boyle for inviting me to post on Teaching the Codex blog, and to Angela Boyle for the English translation. Yes, this is a translated post from my blog about paleography in Spanish. Let us now return to teaching, teaching the codex page. Here I talked about how I taught paleography before and after COVID. I invite you to read the post later if you are interested. And now I will mention two thoughts related to the process of making the post. The first is about writing it. I want to point out that I sacrificed, sacrificed between angles, I sacrificed a lot of information in order to be clear, brief and direct, but I do not mention this sacrifice in the post because I suppose it's implicitly understood by my readers. In the same vein as two years coming yesterday, that a post is not an article. To this, I must add that I have to sacrifice even more information in order to be translated into English which is more concise than Spanish. The second thought is about choosing the photos taking living class, knowing that I only had a few. Choosing some photos was relatively easy. For example, with the works of students taking living class who happily let me use them. However, I was unable to include certain photos as I will now explain. The big problem came choosing the facsimiles because many of the old documents are published and copyrighted, and editors do not allow people to make copies. They want us to buy them. So when I was writing this post, I realized that I could only, I could only share in the post very few photos, such as this one shown here, because I know that this work from the 60s has been recently digitized. This is a pity, and this problem meant that, that, that the post took much longer to write than I thought. For the aforementioned reason, I couldn't include the most impressive photos taken during teaching lessons, nor the most beautiful. And that also means that the choosing photos finally changed a little, the initial But to finish, to finish, let me say, that you must keep in mind that I'm talking about facsimiles of manuals and not facsimiles taken online from libraries because, among other reasons, it saves a lot of work to have them transcribed already. But this leads to the handicap that the plates are in black and white. In addition to removing visual attraction, this also removes information such as the presence of colored initials or paragraphs, which has implications both to the classrooms and for blogging. So thank you very much for your attention. And now I will hand over to Julia. Great, thank you, uh, Leonor, uh, Mary and Henrika. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I'm really excited to be here this evening, um, partly because I am a librarian. Um, I look after um, the library at Merton College, Oxford, and one of the fantastic things about this job is that we have a collection of medieval manuscript books, uh, most of which have been in the college library since the Middle Ages. Um, I'm a fan of teaching the Codex, uh, that whole initiative, and also the Teachable Features uh, blog, because I want people to study our manuscripts and I want people to enjoy and learn from our manuscripts. Now, most of the Teachable Features blog uh, subjects um, have come about 
um, as Mary said, because uh, it was something that a researcher or a teacher um, encountered um, when they were looking at a manuscript and they found something puzzling or interesting or they noticed something um, that was uh, useful uh, for their teaching you uh, that would be an example of a, a feature they wanted to be able to show. Um, but I've also wondered um, whether you can actually go looking for teachable features um, among uh, digitized manuscripts. And I tried just a, a mini experiment using the medieval manuscripts um, in Oxford Library's uh, online catalog, which is um, what you're seeing in the slide here. Uh, Merton College does not have very many fully digitized manuscripts yet, um, but I'm very happy that just over a month ago we completed a project um, to add the descriptions of our manuscripts and our fragments uh, that were done by Rodney Thompson in which you find in a big um, printed catalog. Um, these were added into this online union catalog. Um, in their entirety, and I'd like to hear um, to thank uh, Tuya Ainonen and Matthew Holford, um, who you um, saw on uh, on Monday's uh, session. Um, they were the people who undertook the TEI conversion and got all of um, the Merton manuscripts into this catalog where they can be cross searched. Uh, so I tried a, a keyword search under the term booklets, which is uh, a term that's sometimes used in manuscript descriptions uh, to denote constituent parts of composite manuscripts. Um, I did get some hints uh, on this, and then I uh, used the um, limiting uh, uh, facility in the left-hand uh, menu to limit uh, my hits down to those manuscripts for which there were complete uh, digital versions in the digital dot Bodleian platform. So, um, and you'll see that one of the three manuscripts that came up was Merton College manuscript uh, 249. Um, I wasn't surprised by this because I knew it was there, um, but it's always reassuring uh, when you actually find something in the catalog that you do expect to find. Um, now, Merton manuscript um, 249 was digitized part because it was frequently requested and it has been reproduced a lot. Um, and I think if you go to the next slide, uh, Henrika, um, this is the reason why. Um, it contains a copy of Philippe de Ton's bestiary that has some very um, appealing line drawings. Um, however, this bestiary only accounts for 10 folios of a manuscript that has 192 folios and um, and has 15 constituent parts that were all um, brought together uh, by the mid 14th century. And um, if we see the next slide, I'll just give you an example of, of one of these. In the middle of the manuscript is a 13th century liturgical calendar, perhaps uh, removed from a book of hours or another um, liturgical book, um, and it has uh, received uh, subsequent editions um, after it came into the Merton Library. So fellows of Merton added to it in the way that um, private individuals uh, might have added to, to their own calendar. Um, these digital images uh, that you're seeing here on digital.bodleian, um, I, I would call our old digital images. This, this came up in our discussion um, on Monday. Um, and they're not the best for codicological information. Um, they're, they're basically single shots and the manuscript pages kind of float against the black um, background. Um, and they definitely don't give you as much information um, as the more recent uh, uh, digitized images from some of the projects like the Polanski project. Uh, they do. So um, all I can say is that I've been inspired by that and I hope that we can do better in the future. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, and just um, two other leaves from this manuscript um, include um, a former paste down um, from with a 14th century uh, table of contents written on a 12th century 
a leaf from a 12th century manuscript. And the next slide, um, Henrika, um, and then a slightly later 14th century um, donation inscription um, and table of contents. So it, it provides some way of getting a sense of, of a composite manuscript, um, even though you can't see it in all its three dimensional glory. Uh, before concluding, uh, I would just like to say from my a sort of curatorial point of view um, that libraries really want to know uh, when people are able to use their images for blog posts or, or other things like this. Um, and this is not because we want complete control over those images, but even in those cases where um, um, fortunately you can take your own images and use them or you can download digital images freely. Um, the reason why we want to know about them is that so we can learn about our collections. Um, everything that, that you all produce is, is wonderful for us because this, this helps us build that body of knowledge um, about our manuscripts. And um, it also helps us show our, our owning institutions um, that people do really uh, use our manuscripts that it is worth putting money into digitization projects um, and other things. So um, go out and blog um, and um, please uh, let me know about it. I, uh, that's all I want to say this evening. I'm really looking forward to hearing um, some of the ideas that have come in from blogging. And so I'm gonna hand back to Henrika. Many thanks, Julia, and many thanks, Leonor and Mary, um, a whole, um, full horn plethora of possibilities opening up and to echo um, Julia's last um, plea um, also Oxford Medieval Studies is more than interested in highlighting any collections from Oxford and redundancy is a virtue in that case so um, we very happily reblog things that have been uh, put somewhere else just let us know via Twitter or blog. So um, I know there have been quite a number of submissions for tonight. Uh, we decided to limit it uh, to four um, uh, submissions that follow on in a way from Monday's um, initial thoughts, but I would encourage everybody